Ross here. I'm dropping in on you. Another segment of Riding with Rick. Another real heavy one. Um, and it's becoming far too frequent. I just did a video on the situation in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, about a husband who killed his wife six months into the marriage. Uh, she found out some things going on. He was abusive and um, she filed for divorce and he got served and he killed her. Uh, and I'm thinking like, man, they didn't even get a year in before the choice to marry this dude uh, ended up in her life being lost. And we talk about a bunch of different things when it comes to this. And so, um, you know, when I think about the stuff that I share with you guys with epigenetics and childhood uh, adverse experiences and generational trauma and African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. And I'm telling you that we need to get a handle on this, that we need to be proactive. I just did a video on it. We need to be proactive, uh, that we need to tackle these uh, issues ahead of time because the backside of this thing is ugly and sitting up after it happens and calling it ugly and, 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 and railing on the person who did it doesn't change the fact that it's been done. Somebody's lost a daughter. Another black man who is in prison deserves, definitely deserves to be there. You know, but it could have been, the, the risk of it happening could have been reduced because there's always gonna be darkness, there's always gonna be events, but we are losing our, our, our people far too frequently. We'll kill black black men are killing each other. Black men are killing women. Black men are killing children. Black women are killing uh, one another. I mean, it's a lot of stuff going on out here. But when we start talking about African American adolescent and young adult male violence, I've been talking about this for years. I created Black Men Lead because of this one thing. Now, Black Men Lead became a more powerful resource because we found out that socialization of young black males, racial socialization specifically of young black males doesn't only mitigate the risk for violence, it also mitigates the risk for dropping out of school, going to prison, uh, and some other negative behaviors. Uh, it also increases the opportunity and chance that they will become pro-social, pro-engaged, uh, become positive contributors to society and to the black community specifically. And so I've talked about it, but the bottom line is sitting up and talking about it doesn't mean it's being done at the level it needs to be. We'll, we're, we're doing what we can. We're doing what we can. Uh, I teach anybody who wants to know how to implement the program. If you want to bring me in, uh, I'm willing to stay weeks in a community to teach some of the leaders in that community how to set this program up, how to operate it, the things that we do. and. What we have to believe, and, and my firm belief and my research tells me uh, that we need a universal standard of black manhood. We need a universal definition. We can't go around with this arbitrary idea of what black manhood is based on who I am, based on what I do, good, based on that. That needs to be a specific demand on black men. And I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm really on black men because this is a black issue. This isn't about just black men. Black men are the perpetrators of these issues, but there are black women involved in some of the issues that lead to uh, this type of situation. And this isn't about blaming anybody. This is about saying we aren't, as a collective, doing what's necessary to straighten out some things that are wrong. We have been attacked and assaulted at the very core foundational elements of what would make us strong. We can talk all day long about black group economics. We can talk all day long about black empowerment. We can talk all day long about ownership and, and closing the wealth gap. Here's what I can tell you. If we don't have a foundation at the core, a good strong foundation in the home where we can develop children that grow into powerful, whole, and healed individuals, it's going to be impossible to get them to execute a strategic plan that hasn't even been put into place yet because we can't work together. We can't come together. We can't unify. But it's going to be hard to get them to execute anything because we haven't developed them to do it. We haven't developed them with a sense of identity. There's this massive collective identity crisis. There's this collective bias 
syndrome that exists and I wrote on that. I talked about uh, my collective cognitive bias uh, syndrome theory. Uh, it, it, it is extremely important to understand how we are moving as a mass in our perception of the system and our perception of right people and our perception of one another and how it's sculpting our behavior. But more importantly, when you don't develop a keen sense of awareness, a sense of identity, a sense of self, this is called self-image and self-concept. I've talked about this over and over again. When you don't develop that, especially in young black boys, by the time they're 14 or 15, you will start to see the disruption, the anger, the frustration that's coming out of it. They don't know why, but they don't know who they are. They're trying to discover themselves. They're trying to find themselves. And there's this natural male, masculine push to have a place, to establish some space that's theirs. And when there's an entire system that's hell-bent on taking that space, and there is literally an engineering process of emasculating the black man, then you get young black teens that act out through violence because it is the one way they feel power. And it is not how they should experience power. Power should be experienced in their ability to cover their family, to love their women, to produce, to grow businesses, to be an influential factor and uh, a respected component within the community. That's power. But if you don't teach them that, if you don't inculcate it into their psyche, if you don't build it inside of them, that their power is in the ability for them to execute their masculinity by being present, by being powerful, but also by doing the things that are necessary to ensure that the people that are under their covering are, don't want to hit nothing, under their covering are safe. There's nothing to me more fulfilling as a man than to know the people who I'm responsible for covering feel safe. And they, they need to feel safe in a number of different ways, but they feel safe. But definitely they need to feel safe physically. So when they don't feel safe physically, then there's all these other things that come about. And so my thing is this. This, oh, and I said all this and, I, and it never got to the thing. <laughs> oh man, we, we, we under, we're in a situation. Anyway, a young black male in Georgia, Matthew, I can't think of his last name right now but I'll put it in the description box. Killed 24-year-old Matthew. Can't think of his last name. So much going on. Killed his 20-year-old wife of 10 days. 20 years old. They had just been married 10 days, and he stabbed her to death. Stabbed her nine times. It took the jury, it took the jury 15 minutes to convict him. I don't know what the sentence would be, whatever it is, it's, it, he deserves it. Uh, but again, saying he deserves it, talking about how evil he is, talking about what a terrible travesty this is, talking about how horrible it is for black women, does absolutely nothing on the back end. That's my thing. These are things we're supposed to be dealing with and confronting on the front end. These are things that we're supposed to be changing, mitigating, and uh, making better. We are supposed to be involved on the front end. We are sitting up and thinking that these kids are going to just automatically get this right. No, it's our responsibility to set this course in a direction that's beneficial to our race beneficial to the children who are growing up beneficial we are turning our daughters loose in a world where it is likely that their mate could kill them the number one leading cause of death for black females between the age of 15 and 44 is an intimate partner homicide not just being killed but being killed by the person that you're in love with the person that's supposed to protect you the person that's supposed to care for you is the person that's killing you that can't be the norm 
things happen. There's things that go out of the way. It's never going to be okay, but there, but when it is so consistent that I can pick up my ticker because I'm a part of media, I can pick up my ticker and see it almost on a daily basis. That's a problem. It's a problem. And here it is. Let me tell you something. 24 and 20 in the right state, in the right frame of mind, in the right era would have been okay for marriage. The, 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 the mental and emotional development of black men specifically doesn't qualify them to be married at 24. You know, I was married at 24, had been married five years at 24. And I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't abusive. I didn't attack. I didn't cheat. But just the stress of saying I'm responsible for all this at 24 and having somebody that's just on a whole nother wavelength as you and you are responsible for that person. It takes a whole lot not to just sit up and go left because it's just it just it, I was just built different. I was just built to love and protect. And so at some point I had to realize this isn't going to end well one way or another. And I had to let it go. That was the hardest thing I've ever done is actually having to let that first one go because you, nobody wants a divorce under that power. You know, none of them are good. But and, and it wasn't that that was a good situation. It was just the first marriage. It's, it's like, hey, I didn't get married to get divorced. But but the thing is, there I was. So then what? So my thing is. I, I, and you got to think, I was reared by my great grandparents. I was reared by people who came from a whole different era that nobody in my age, very few people in my age group could understand. So the principles, the values, how a man carries himself, what a man does, all the expectations involved with it were totally different than the other guys in my age group. And then I was still a part of that age group that while I was grown and I, I was responsible for my home and I was making more money than my grandfather had ever made in his life at any time, I was still accountable to my grandfather. He was still the patriarch of the family. He was still the head. And I was responsible to him and he wasn't having it. And here's the crazy thing about the difference in that, in that situation and what we got now. My grandparents begged me not to marry my first wife told me all kinds of, they did not want me to marry my, but once I married her, my grandfather sent said, said me down early in the game when he saw me still behaving single in some ways, like going out, leaving my wife at that, like having my wife at their house and I leave and go hang out with my boys watch. Uh, they put him to say, hey look, we told you not to marry that girl, but you had to marry her. That's your wife now. So this is what you're going to do. And it was real simple. I'm a grown man. I'm a young grown man, but I'm a grown man. My grandfather tells me, look, no. This, no, you tell your boys you can't hang out like that no more. Tell them you'll holler at them every now and then, but you're going to take care. You got a wife and a family now. Because, see, when I married her, she already had a kid and she was pregnant with my oldest. And that, that kid she had, that, that's one of my tightest, that's my heart. And that's something else I was taught. You don't go marry her if you don't, you're not ready to accept the kids. That, but that was a whole different level. Of so I took that on. I'm talking 19. Took it on. And now I'm telling you, there's no kids out there. You're asking for problems when you push kids into situations like that. Because we're not developing them, developing them. Shoot, you got men in their 40s that don't have the emotional maturity to deal with that type of responsibility now. Because we're building them different. Certain things don't age. Certain things don't become archaic and out of date. Being a man and handling your business, and don't get me wrong, I've not been perfect. You know, I still got things I'm growing on, but I show up every day to love my family. I show up every day to be the best I can to the woman in my life. And I still treat the women who are now in my past like queens. I handle them with care. You spent time with me. You gave me your heart for a moment. It didn't work out, but I appreciate the time you gave me and trusted me with your heart and your life. I'm sorry it didn't work out, but hey, you need me, call me. That, see, that's considered a simp nowadays. So, man, if that blah, blah, blah. 
to have that mindset calls for a disconnect from an understanding of who we are. Again, I'm not trying to paint myself as this person as, you know, no, but I love my people. I love black women. I am a black man. So I'm always going to be in the gap for you guys. I'm always going to cut for you guys. But a part of being in the gap for you guys is challenging you to step up. See, that's a problem nowadays, too. If you challenge somebody uh, against where they are, you are a hater. You, you're against them. You're being mean. You're evil. Nobody wants to hold anybody to a standard. So everybody's not saying, that's not my business. And so everybody's out there trying to figure out this thing. See, when I did it, I had my grandpa, I had the men at the church, I had the men in the community, even the old cat sitting under the tree playing dominoes, smoking the cigars. Hey, 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 little man, come here. Hey, young buck, let me holler at you. What you, what you doing over there? Hey, let me tell you something. Slide, sit on over, let me slide. And they, they, they giving you game. And it's not game to go out and screw stuff up. It's a game to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm gonna save you some headaches. I'm gonna save you some hardships. I'm gonna put you on. I'm but, and if I catch you out here doing that crazy, I'm gonna call you on it. The OGs, cats that you know got bodies. Hey man, you don't need to be out here with us. Hey man, I don't wanna see you hanging with him no more. You got a chance to get out of here. And then they put the word out, he off limits. That ain't happening no more. We're not protecting the assets. How do you, you we, how many times have I heard? The children are the future. We're not acting like it. We're not acting like it. Oh, they cute. We dress them up and send them off places and brag about how cute they are, brag about the little fly stuff they say, but we're not protecting them. We're not, we're making them cute and they're going to go out there and get their cute asses tore up. They're going to go out there and get their cute asses tore up because there's a world out there that don't care about how cute they are. There's a world out there that literally will chew them up and spit them out and exploit them in every way possible and leave them for dead. And it's our responsibility to pre prepare them to navigate that world. Uh, again, the family, got my, the uh, prayers go out to the family of the young lady who lost her life. Uh, I think her name was Shadrika Watkins. Um, right now, my mind is drawing a blank. I think it was Shadrika Watkins. Uh, but uh, what I can tell you is it's unacceptable. We got to do something different. I'm challenging the people who watch this video to do more than just hit the like button and talk about, oh, my God. I'm, now, I want to encourage you. Share how you feel about it. Say what's on your mind. Let it rip. But that can't be the end of it. It's time to unify. It's time to come together. It's time to get behind things that work. It's time to put boots on the ground in large numbers. It's time to sit up and say, not on my watch. It is. And so the question is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Look, I'm going to get off of here um, because the more I think about this, it's the more frustrating it gets. And I really came here to sort of unwind. It's been a crazy couple of days. Uh, but I came here to unwind. But well, hey, look, if you believe in the work we're doing at the Odyssey Project, you've seen the videos, you've seen the, the pictures and the films of the work. Um, we're having some maintenance issues on the site right now, so it's down temporarily. It should be back up by tomorrow. Uh, but what, whatever's going on, look, I'm actually in the process of trying to connect with some more people and actually get some push in several cities to start the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative and also to start a sister program along with that. And I'm hoping uh, that we can uh, get that stuff done uh, this year, not, I mean, all of it. it's going to take a while to get around the different cities and actually train, but I want to get the link ups done. I want to get the things moving. 
we are against the wall and against the clock and we act like we've got all the time in the world and we're steadily becoming what Dr. Anderson, Dr. Claude Anderson said we would, a permanent underclass. And it's happening so smoothly and cunningly and subtly that we don't even see it. We bitch and whine, go back to business as usual. Bitch and whine, go back to business as usual. And every time something happens, we're further and further behind the eight ball. It's time to come together. Or we just gonna be totally overrun. And then it won't it won't matter anymore at that point. On that note, look, I'm out of here, you guys. Thank you for letting me take up your time. Have a good one.